You're listening to HBCU in Entertainment, where diversity, equity, and inclusion refine the future of entertainment. I am your host, Stacey Milner, and welcome back to another episode. Today, I want to introduce you to an amazing American film producer who creates impact-driven entertainment, Scott Budnick. Let me read his bio for you. Scott Budnick is a film producer, founder of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, ARC, and CEO of One Community. As the executive vice president of Todd Phillips' Green Hats Films, Budnick produced Old School, Due Date, and the highest grossing R-rated comedy trilogy in film history, The Hangover, which grossed over $1.4 billion. On top of spearheading some amazing projects, which we'll talk about today, Scott is also a fierce advocate for social justice and works to attain a fairer judicial system. So without further ado, I am happy to introduce you to Scott Butnick. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to have you here. Excited to be here, Stacy. Wonderful. Um, well, I've got a few questions for you. Kind of want to walk through a few things here. You do, you do amazing work. You've got a great background. And I think our audience will really glean a lot of information from this session. So if we can just start with you just kind of walking me through or walking us through your professional journey and how you went from, you know, being executive vice president at Green Hat Films to founder and creator of your own production company with one community. I mean, Take us through the journey. Like, how does all of this happen? How did this come to be? Absolutely. Well, it all started uh, in Atlanta, uh, which is home, and also where I went to college at Emory. Uh, and um, I uh, started out working for a casting director uh, in Atlanta while I was going to college. Uh, actually started out before that as an extra on a TNT miniseries called Andersonville. Um, was so blown away that uh, I decided to change my major in college. I was actually pre-med um, oh. and became a business major and a film minor and ended up working in casting uh, my entire college experience, did tons of movies, television shows while in Atlanta, uh, ended up after my uh, sophomore and junior year of college, coming out to Los Angeles to intern after sophomore year, intern on Baywatch, uh, and got to spend 12 hours a day on the beach shooting a TV show. Wow. And then um, uh, after my junior year at United Talent Agency, UTA, and got to see the inner workings of a talent agency and also a real overview of the entire business doing that. And then I graduated, packed up the U-Haul, drove cross country, spent six months trying to find a job, couldn't, uh, macaroni and cheese, ramen soup, uh, mm -hmm. ran out of money, and then ultimately got the call to go work uh, with Todd Phillips uh, as at first a casting assistant on his, his movie Road Trip. So I did casting and pre-production. Then I became a production assistant on the movie. And then midway through the movie, uh, he fired his assistant and said, hey, Budnick, do you want to be my assistant? I became his assistant on Road Trip, continued with him on his second movie, Old School. And then on that movie, he made me a producer and then the president of his company and ultimately produced a string of comedies with him uh, from Starsky and Hutch to Hangover, One, Two, and Three, Due Date, Project X, War Dogs. Um, and then uh, as we were doing War Dogs, I ended up leaving the business uh, to start a nonprofit, took a 90% pay cut, um, left my position of power, started the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, helping young men and women that were in the prison system, but then realized that like my biggest tool in my toolbox to kind of make social change was my ability to make movies and TV shows and tell stories that were big, that were commercial, but also could impact people and create empathy. So I started one community, uh, Just Mercy with Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx about the criminal justice system was our first film and that was the journey. Wow. That's a crazy journey. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of, you know, next generation, you know, talent coming out. It's like, you know, I don't want to be an assistant. And it's just like that rite of passage in this industry, assistant, mailroom at the agencies, like 
those are just so critical for I'll you. Be honest, Stacey, business. I'll be honest. The reason that I spent 16 years with Todd Phillips as a CEO and of his company and producer of his films was because on road trip, I showed up earlier than everyone. I stayed later than everyone. I outworked everybody. I had a better attitude. I never complained. Like I, the, the moment he decided for me to be his assistant, we were shooting at a gas station. And I was frantically sweeping with a broom in my hand, uh, the gas station, because we had just turned the cameras around and talk about like doing the, the, the least desirable job. I was basically a janitor uh, with a college degree, but it didn't matter to me. I was just going to do it and I was going to do it really well. And he walked up to me and he said, I see how hard you're working. I see you're the first one here, last one to leave. Like, I want you to be my assistant. And so it was being a production assistant and a glorified janitor and a glorified secretary um, that led me to be his assistant, which led me to be a junior producer, to led me to be the producer, to led me to become the CEO of the company. So I think working in a mailroom and I pushed a mail card around a talent agency before I did any of that. Right. Uh, so my college degree, my bachelor's degree, my, my prestigious school, like I understood all of that. That was great, but really it was the work ethic. It was the, uh, the ability and the desire to do anything to get the job done that made me kind of in the role that I had. Right. And then at further to that point, Talk about how incredibly valuable that is, right? That you're sitting alongside the people that someday you hope to be, or, you know, this is a business I want to be in. Being in those kind of, you know, lower roles or those junior roles where you're kind of paying your dues, like that is so critical to you learning the business, the culture, the etiquette, like there's such value in that. And so I'm sure that there was a huge takeaway from you even though you, you know, were in those roles, like I'm sure that that positioned you to run your own things and to be where you are today. Well, I mean, the key to this business right here is knowledge, work ethic and relationships, right? That's yeah. it. Um, and when you are, even if you're an assistant to a director, rather than being a PA and going to lock up a set on the other side, you're now sitting by the monitor. You're watching the director talk to the director of photography, the director talk to the producers, the director talk to his editor, the director talk to casting. You're learning not just what the director you work for, the producer you work for is does as a job. You realize how everyone else does their job and who's great at it and who's not great at it and why. Um, so the amount of knowledge you have just being in that proximity, no matter the role is incredible. Um, and the relationships you make working for a director the amount of other directors you make meet, producers you meet, actors you meet, writers that you meet, um, studio executives that you meet. These are the calls that you're fielding. These are the people that get to know you. Um, these lower level jobs are are tremendous for building that work ethic, building that knowledge base, and really building those relationships. Well, I tell you, all of what you just said is the heart of why I do what I do with our HBCU and LA programs. Um, because I know how important, you know, the knowledge is, right? And then establishing how to have that work ethic and then building those relationships. If you're not in this, what I call inner circle of Hollywood, you're not going to learn it. This is These are things you just don't get in the classroom. You have to be in the environment and do that. So I love this, um, but I'm going to ask you now, like what were some of your challenges, right? Or barriers that you faced breaking into this industry? Um, and then how did you overcome them? I mean, uh, I'll be honest with you. It's like at the beginning, like Todd Phillips, who I worked with for 16 years when I was a production assistant, like he didn't like me, right? His first words were, with me was, hey, Budnick, I've been watching you and you're the kind of guy I hated in college. Um, wow. And I had just moved to take this job to impress this guy. And that's, that's that was how we got off to a start, right? And like, it, it was putting my head down, knowing that if I just was going to work hard, that that would be noticed. And I just started showing up early, working hard, and was relentless about that. And the UPM saw me and he's like, this guy Budnick is great. Like I can depend on him. He's I can count on him. If he says he's going to do something, he's always going to do something. And then the producer, Danny Goldberg, 
said, this guy Budnick's great. And he started pulling me in to do stuff for him. And then once Todd saw the UPM, Joe Dishner, and the producer, Danny Goldberg, pulling me in to do stuff for them because my heart was in this, he turned or turned it around on me and um, started pulling me in to do stuff for him. And so once he made me his assistant, he would say, hey, Budnick, like he would challenge me. He would say, hey, Budnick, I just shot this party scene and I've seen everyone's faces. I need a hundred more extras in an hour. We're gonna be ready to shoot this next scene in an hour and we're turning around, I need a hundred more extras. And I would have to jump in my car and go find a hundred people and caravan back with a hundred people, which I did. Wow. Um, wow. And he'd say, hey, Budnick, we're in Atlanta, Georgia. It's 11 o'clock at night. He said, hey, Budnick, I need a black college step team by 6 a.m. call time tomorrow. Go figure it out. So at midnight, I'm at Morehouse and I'm at Clark and I'm finding not just a college step team, but I'm finding the best step team, right? Yeah. And at 6 a.m., there they are. And so like being able to not take disrespect personally oh. to not take the fact that this guy I'm trying to impress had not seen it yet and to just keep my head down and outwork people, like that's what did it. Wow. I love it. Oh, I hope you audience is listening to this. These are these are gems. Um, so really excited. Um, now tell us, you know, what goes into creating a franchise that generates more than $1.4 billion? Like what, what's behind that? Like, what goes into that? Can you share a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it starts with an idea, right? We had uh, two writers who were coming into my office for a general meeting. Um, general meeting means there's no agenda, right? We're just getting to know each other. Uh, I had read a script that they wrote. I liked it. I liked their writing style, like their humor. We came in, we had a 45 minute meeting. Before it was over, I said, before you walk out that door, will you pitch me an idea that you guys are thinking about that maybe we could do together. And they're like, yeah, well, kind of have this idea of a bachelor party, but like they get so messed up, but they don't remember what happened the night before and the groom, groom goes missing. So instead of a bachelor party movie, it's really an investigation to find this groom and get him back for his wedding. And so right away, it was like, as a producer realizing, wait a second, that is a really interesting way to tell a story uh, that's just it could be a pure bachelor party comedy, but to do it very non-linearly and doing it as an investigation. And ultimately, it's a wedding movie, right? So women will be there. So understanding why the idea works and then being able to convince my boss, Todd Phillips, he loved it. He decided he wanted to write it um, to then be able to get the studio to green light it, to have a budget, to get it, like all of that. Um, ultimately made the movie for $30 million and hang, hang over one gross $477 million off a $30 million movie. But it was really Todd Phillips believing in himself. Mm -hmm. um, he cut his directing fee to zero and took ownership in the movie and weighed, made much more than wow. he would have if he just made his fee, right? Um, going with actors- Willing to take that risk, right? It was just risk like better himself. Cast actors who at that point, Bradley Cooper, Ed Helms, Zach Galifianakis, Mr. Chow, Ken Jeong, uh, Justin Bartha, they, they were not famous. They were not movie stars, right? So taking a risk on these guys who had not quite popped as major movie stars yet or comedy stars and breaking them as comedy stars, that was huge. And then really everything from finding the right release date, competing with big movies, um, being very kind of honed in on the marketing campaign, the poster, the trailer, uh, test screening it, listening to audiences, hearing what they loved. Um, Todd's just an unbelievable filmmaker. He's so talented. He's so funny himself. He is so invested in the process. Um, and really it was, it was that. Right. And it takes all of that, right? In order for, you know, things to, and sometimes you can have all of that and then it still doesn't work, but it takes this, the set process. Think about, think about how long of a process that is, right? Like for yeah. someone that works on a crew, they come in for three months. That's production, three months. We were developing a script two years before that. We were editing a year after that. So while they're in for three months, we're in for three years, right? So this is our baby. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, you take a major pay cut, you move into another space. Um, so I think that takes us to, you know, the work that you do from a social justice standpoint. Uh, what was the passion behind that? I mean, I know you decided at some point, like, I want to do, I want to do more. I want to, so tell me, tell me what that, what that story is. I mean, first off, I grew up in a house with a mom and a dad who would always make us be of service, right? There wasn't a Thanksgiving. We weren't feeding the homeless, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so that was ingrained in me. And I'm just like from my core, and I don't even know where it comes from. I, I have a burning passion and I get so angry when I see injustice and inequality, right? Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Atlanta. Um, clearly the city is, when I grew up there was black and white. There was no other diversity. It was black and white. And at 15 years old, I became a DJ and I started DJing weddings and clubs and all types of things. And it brought me into the housing projects where I started DJing. And just seeing the level of inequality, income inequality, poverty in Atlanta, um, and then would leave the projects DJing and drive back to my nice suburban house where my dad was a doctor and my mom was a teacher. I think that was very shocking to see. So when I came out to LA and spent four years just in the film business, I was really unsatisfied, right? Nice restaurants, nightclubs, but every conversation was about writers, directors, actors, but nothing was about like how to make the, the city a better place or how to help people that were struggling. And um, ultimately in 2004, a friend of mine uh, told, asked me to come to a juvenile hall in LA and meet kids who were incarcerated and speak to them. And I did. And the first kid I met was 15 years old uh, in this prison. And I said, how was your week? And he said, it was a really bad week. I just got sentenced to 300 years to life in prison. Mm -hmm. And to hear a 15 year old little boy say that was a shock to the conscience. And I said, what happened? And he said, I stood next to my friend who shot the victim in the butt. And for standing next to the shooter, I got 300 years of life in prison. And it was just very clear for, for me at that point that if that was my kid, he would be out on bail because I would have bailed him out. Mm -hmm. He would uh, probably get the best lawyer in LA and get probation and not spend one day in prison for not shooting at someone. But David was going to prison for 300 years of life because he didn't have my resources or my skin color because he was from the foster care system, because he had nobody fighting for him, nobody loving him. And of course he turned to the streets to try to find that kind of love. And so um, that just set me on this path and it's been an incredible balance to everything we deal with in the film and television business. Wow. I love it. Um, that's, that's my heart, right? I'm, 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 I'm a servant at heart. I, I, I want to serve others. So you just, Amen. It, it is, it is what we're here to do, right? We are to do good yes. for others. And so anyway, don't get me preaching to you. Um, but anyway, um, so how does one community, you know, actively promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within the workplace? And what initiatives have you implemented to create a more inclusive and representative uh, environment, you know, amongst your own team? Absolutely. Um, well, I think first off, the mission of the entire company beyond the folks that are sitting all around me right now, the mission of our entire company is to put women and people of color behind the camera, in front of the screen, et cetera, so um, most of the movies we're developing have writers of color, directors of color, or women. Um, we're telling stories of people of color. We're telling stories um, uh, that are um, uh, all around gender equality, et cetera. So the entire mission um, of the company is doing this. And obviously the people who are on this team to execute that mission, um, share the same levels of diversity, right? Our staff is very, very heavily diverse, mostly diverse um, women, people of color, LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, and it's exactly, we look at this in determining how we build our cast and crews on movies, right? We, we look at what contractors we use to do different work for us, what caterers we use, et cetera. It goes into every decision-making point at this company. Um, and we've signed 
basically every pledge in Hollywood um, with everybody. Michael B. Jordan was one of the the the, the most important that, that kind of kicked this all off. Um, but uh, it's been great. It's incredibly fulfilling. And, and it also makes for a better product. It makes us tell better stories. It makes, it makes us understand a global audience better. Um, so what you're doing, Stacey, and getting more and more HBCU students out here, there's no way you can scale uh, as much as what the need is, because this is what makes this entire industry legit and run and tell stories that speak to a very wide global population. I love it. Now, um, and thank you for that. Um, and I, I'm thrilled that I, I got chosen to be able to you know, bring this. And it again, it was me being in the industry, right? And seeing the talk and the the rhetoric. And it's like, there's a way to do this, guys. We can we can fix this. There's a solution. So um, but now I want to go back to you. So I've noticed that, you know, all of your projects have, you know, an impact attached, um, you know, an impact initiative attached to it, right? Um, you produce some amazing films like Respect, you know, the biopic of Aretha Franklin, which I love, Just Mercy. I actually got a chance to tour with um, Warner Brothers when they were doing that. And we took the film to HBCUs and did a screening and we did talkbacks and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And I wish I had known you then. I would have drug brought you along. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, um, when developing these stories, you know, or picking which projects you create, you know, which comes first, the story you hope to tell or the impact that you hope to create? Well, I think first, I think the most important thing, and this is really important for everyone to understand, the movie going audience does not come to see a movie to be preached to, taught something, they want to be entertained, right? So first and foremost, it can't feel like med medicine, it cannot feel like vegetables, and it cannot feel like an academic exercise. This is the entertainment business, right? So first and foremost, the question when we read something, when we watch something is, is this going to be entertaining? Is Can this bring in a wide audience? I don't want to make impact with an audience of 10,000. I want to make impact with an audience of 10 million, 100 million, et cetera. So first and foremost, is it entertainment, right? And that means getting at some of these impact stories through horror, comedy, thriller, not just like heavy dramas, right? So if you think of a movie like Get Out, right? Like great example of something that we could have run with on the impact side, but was highly commercial. Um, and then we have a head of impact. Her name's Rachel Cook. And everything our content team reads and likes from an entertainment perspective, she reads and gives a whole analysis of what type of impact campaign can we build around it? And can we actually make impact in people's lives and communities in the world by telling this story, right? Could this story create empathy in people's hearts for a population that maybe they didn't have empathy for, whether it may be the formerly incarcerated, currently incarcerated, homeless, LGBT, folks who are living in poverty, uh, et cetera. Um, and then what does that campaign look like? On Just Mercy, we created an enormous campaign and it wasn't just to talk to the choir, right? We had an enormous conservative campaign where we partnered with the American Conservative Union and wanted to talk criminal justice reform with conservatives. We also realized that like white evangelicals were not on board. So we partnered with the uh, um, National Association of Evangelicals and we did a huge campaign with evangelicals around the country and had formerly incarcerated people in the pulpit on opening weekend. Wow. We partnered with the NBA, created the Play for Justice initiative where dozens of NBA teams have now gone into prisons to play basketball, to have conversations, and now they're connected. We we partnered with the National Governors Association and went and screened the film with governors and their chiefs of staff and then ran legislation when a governor cried at the end of watching Just Mercy and I had to bring them tissues, right? So a huge, robust campaign, but we needed a commercial music movie first. That was a tough one, right? It's a heavy subject matter, but when you can have Michael B. Jordan 
playing the great Brian Stevenson, when you can have Jamie Foxx playing Walter McMillan, when you can have Brie Larson in the film, now you have a much more commercial drama than if it was a bunch of kind of lesser known actors and actresses. So um, entertainment first, but massive on the impact. Wow. And so intentional and strategic. I love yeah. that. Right. Uh, and if you don't have that, I don't think you quite get what you're going after anyway. Yep. Um, wow. Um, so as the founder of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, ARC, I think you uh, refer to it as, talk to us about the impact and the mission of ARC and how it's setting an example for other industry players, you know, to drive meaningful change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, ARC is an organization that helps people when they come home to, from prison and while they're inside prison um, live their best life. Um, and so we're a community of, of, of formerly incarcerated people and their allies that help people get on their feet, whether it's housing, mentorship, therapy, jobs, college, school, university, scholarships, all of the above. Um, we have... Uh, we have a, an incredible um, training program that we partner with called Hollywood CPR that gets a lot of our folks into the unions in the entertainment business. So we have dozens, if not hundreds of ARC members that are union uh, union camera operators, grips, electric, sound, uh, production design, set dressers, et cetera. Um, so we have hundreds of people in the business that are in the unions doing that. We have an incredible partnership with NBC Universal where every year we put dozens of interns who are formerly incarcerated uh, onto the Universal Studios lot working in various departments. And almost all of them convert to full-time jobs because they work so hard. Uh, same with DreamWorks um, and a couple of the talent agencies. And really we train our folks that um, if you're not half an hour early, you're late, you're early every day, you work your butt off, you have an attitude of gratitude and People are going to want you, and they do. Um, doesn't matter your criminal record. Doesn't matter that you come from a diverse population. Um, if you get in there and you bring that attitude and that hustle and that intelligence and all of that to the table, then you're going to shine. And we see them shining at the highest levels. Man, that's incredible. Um, I mean, because otherwise, like, how do they get that? How do they get that opportunity? Right. Um, and this is so I, I just think it's incredible. I really do. I, I, I think my biggest asset at this point is using the privilege to kick the door open and then letting them show the world how great they are. Right. Right. Well, you know what they need is somebody to believe in them and to say, hey, give give me a shot. Like, I am not just what you see on the surface. There is someone inside that's either damaged, bruised, traumatized, whatever. And this is an opportunity to wrap our arms around, give them the support and services that they need, and then watch them like flourish and grow. You know? I, think that's, I think that's everything. I think it's why the mentorship piece of what you do um, for these students that are coming to LA is so crucial. I mean, there's no one I met on my journeys whether it's someone in the criminal justice system or someone I grew up with. Um, and you ask them like, what were, what was the biggest change in your life? How did you change your life? What were the biggest moments that led you to this career? They're all always going to talk about a person that believes in them. They're always going to talk about someone, an adult who was consistent, who was there that saw their potential, et cetera. So like the work you're doing, Stacy, is incredible. You're Thank really you. changing the face of our business. Thank you. So one last question. For students looking to land a career in this entertainment business, um, that really, I mean, this business does really create impact. What advice or wisdom would you share with them? Show up, grind, and have a great attitude. Be, be the person that everyone wants to be around for 12 hours a day as we're in the trenches together. That attitude, that humor, um, having good vibes, having good energy, that is everything. But that grind, right? Everyone wants to talk smack about millennials, Gen Z, work ethic, yada, yada, yada. I'll tell you this, the Gen Z millennials that I work with that may have come out of the juvenile justice system, they grind harder than anybody. So I think coming with that work ethic and that attitude of gratitude and being grateful every day, that's everything. You'll crush. 
Right. Well, um, this has been another great episode. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. Yes. Um, yes. It has been incredible. So let's keep on sharing the good news and doing the good work and making impact and change because it's going to take us to do it. So thank you so much for coming on. God bless everyone. I want to thank you for joining me today and tuning in to another episode of HBCU and Entertainment. If this episode resonated with you, please comment, rate, and review, and share this podcast. Your feedback means the world to me. Until next time, know that I appreciate you for lending me your ears. Catch you in the next episode.